Today we have an amazing panel that's going, um, we have Chris Smith, Ira Wallace, Melissa DeSell, and Bonita Adeb. Um, and we're going to learn more about the Collaborative Heirloom Collar Project. The Heirloom Collar Project aims to build a coalition of seed stewards, gardeners, farmers, chefs, and seed companies working to preserve heirloom collards and their culinary heritage. And um, this will showcase um, the evolution of the heirloom collard project as a living case study and um, all of the collaborators um, and how they've sustained themselves over time. Um, and I just want to say before I pass this over to Kristen, oh, I'm so sorry, Kristen. And Kristen is also on this panel as well from Seed Service Exchange. My apology, Kristen. Um, before I pass this over to Kristen, I just want to say uh, we are making 2022 the year of the collar. So please join me in welcoming our amazing panel. Please give them um, a virtual welcome. You can use your emojis with the reaction button. Um, Kristen, please take it away. You're on mute. Dave. Oh, there you go. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Melanie, and thank you, OSA, for this wonderful offering. Um, we're so excited to tell you all about the Heirloom Collard Project. It is a project that's shown strength of collaboration in so many ways, but has also overcome the challenges of working together. This, uh, this results uh, a project that's way greater than the sum of its parts, and we're proud to share some of the journeys and the lessons with you that we've learned along the way. So today we'll explore what does it take to create a community around a seed project, and why is collaboration important? Uh, of course, there's always challenges along the way, but there's also rewards, and um, you'll get to hear a little bit about the challenges and rewards of our project. Um, and how do we maintain momentum over time and with diverse partners? So I'm, whether you're here just to get inspired to start your own project or you have a seed project that you've been waiting to cultivate and needing some inspiration for, we hope you get a lot out of hearing the Heirloom Collard Project story together. So thank you for joining our panel of collard loving community seed activists and leaders to discuss this project. And we are going to start off with Ira Wallace from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. Ira. Yes, I'm glad to start it off. Um, and uh, could you show the next slide? This all started with a book. Uh, John uh, Morgan and Ed Davis uh, made this book, Collard, A Southern Tradition from Sea to Table. And Ed Davis shared a copy of it with me and suggested maybe we do something at the Heritage Harvest Festival at Monticello. And as chance would have it, within two weeks, I had reason to go to Charleston, South Carolina where a USDA researcher, Mark Farnham, was growing out about 60 of the varieties that had been collected by Davis and Morgan. And these, I didn't know, you wanna uh, get the next slide? I didn't know how much variety there was in heirloom collards, especially I had never seen all of these crazy purple collards and uh, I was, uh, you know, familiar with the glazes, but I didn't know there were so many short ones and wide ones. Uh, and uh, the, yeah, so I came away from that because uh, I was going to go to, seed, I'm a Seed Savers Exchange active member and someday when we get to go to Heritage Farm again, I'll get to go there. But I was going to go there. And so tour at, uh, Seed Savers and I started talking about bringing some collards uh, to a heritage farm. And we just got all excited and Tor uh, Ping, the USDA gene bank, and they agreed to give us samples of all of the ones that they had enough of, which amounted to more than 60 varieties. And so we were a little bit off and running and we had the next year, oh, show some more. I get so, next slide, <laughs> I'm gonna use this. I uh, forgot to mention one of the things was about 
these varieties is that they were being sorted by older stewards. I think the average age was over 60 and uh, it had been when they collected the seeds and it had been almost 10 years by the time the book came out. So we know, and many of these stewards were not going to carry on. Uh, one of the places that does carry on some of that in a more traditional way is a collard shack in Aden, North Carolina. They uh, sell yellow cabbage collard and henpecked. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. And uh, there they are, which is a yellow green one. And it's uh, the yellow cabbage collard is very popular in North Carolina and is one of the ones that is being revived. It was boarded onto the Ark of Taste. Talking the college with so many opportunities to uh, work together. It was amazing. Let's look at a few more of the varieties so we can talk about what more of the blue ones. Uh, I When I saw that trial, I liked uh, that they had that color matching so that you could look back and see if in your soils you had even the same uh, color collard coming from the seeds. Uh, let's look at the next one. This one really surprised me because uh, this particular collard was not only did it have a white flower, which is unusual, but it was flowering a month ahead of the other varieties. And it came from down in that Florida, uh, Georgia border. So we think it might have been selected uh, for uh, producing seed in a, uh, an area where there wasn't uh, enough cold temperatures. We don't know, but something was going on. Uh, let's look at the next one. Oh my goodness. This is a story. There's room for everyone in the heirloom collard story, even if you think that they might not be. And uh, sorority sister, Lorraine Mortiz of Alpha Kappa Alpha, she's with uh, Master Gardener Elma Kesey. And I had met her at a Southern Garden History, very fancy gardening workshop. And she had, uh, asked me about the heirloom collards and was the first uh, group that took seeds for regeneration and sent seeds back to seed savers. And seed savers took those seeds and sent them to be put in a deposit in the Global Seed Bank at Svalbard. And so this is the first uh, seeds that are known to be maintained and regenerated by an African-American uh, group that's in Svalbard. Uh, you never know when you're networking how far the reach will be. Uh, and here it is, William Alexander Heading. And you wonder why that medal is there? It's because they were trying so hard uh, to get seeds from these. And every so often, the deer would come and preferentially eat all the William Alexander uh, seeds. So uh, Mr. Kesey got some old uh, wire and made uh, cages and they were able to save them and bring them through to maturity. Um, yeah, and I, I want to say something that the Heirloom Project has really reached out in a way that I hadn't ha seen before uh, to uh, communities of color who sometimes feel like their history is not reflected in, in our seed saving mo movement. Uh, but I'm also, you know, finding out that, uh, you know, people in other parts like Brazil, that collards, I, I didn't think of collards as Brazilian. They, they, they have a special thing for cutting collards up into small pieces. So uh, it, it allowed me to bring a whole new variety of stories and into um, what the work that we do and uh, working with seed savers and reaching out to original donors and to people who donated collard seeds to the collection has been great. And our you know, friends at Utopian Seed Project are reaching out to chefs and to people in the local community and uh, 
down at Working Foods, they're doing all these wonderful things. And I'm going to let, turn you over to Melissa, who's going to tell you about it. Thank you, Ara, for that brief history. And I'm so excited. This has been one of the most fun, engaging, inspiring projects I've been a part of. And um, it came you know, during the height of the pandemic in 2020. And I think it gave us all a lot of hope for the future when things are feeling kind of bleak. So um, I'm Melissa Desa. I'm calling in from North Central Florida in Gainesville uh, from unceded Timucuan and Seminole tribal lands. And I have the great honor to be a part of a nonprofit called Working Food. And we celebrate and help elevate our local food community. And we were one of the colored uh, project participants and organizers. So I'm going to sort of take over um, where Ira left off. If you want to slip to the next slide, please. So part two, um, you know, after, you know, I remember years ago being at Seed Savers Exchange and kind of being a little fly on the wall when Ira and Tor were talking about these heirloom collards and kind of nudging my face in to say, I'd love to be a part of this when it when it starts to pick up and then kind of hadn't heard about it for a long time. It uh, it went dormant for a little bit after that initial um, trial and all the work that uh, Ira talked about, um, staff changes, things happen with community projects, and it kind of collected dust for a bit until about 2020 when Nora Hummel, who was um, up until just very recently working for Seed Savers Exchange, sort of found this project sitting on the shelf collecting dust, if you will, and uh, was like, wow, this project is amazing. We should kickstarted again and she started doing some outreach to people that were interested in a part of this early on and potentially new people to see what we could maybe do next. Uh, next slide. So Seed Savers Exchange helped coordinate or they did coordinate um, a national 2020 heirloom collar trial and some of you on the call might have been participants in it. And it was a huge national and international, there's a few folks in Canada, that participated in a citizen science um, trial. And so they were sent three random varieties of collards from this collection and linked up with the app Seed Linked to enter all of their data. And you can see there was participants from all over. There were, let's see, 52 farmers and 192 gardeners joined this trial and reported results, which is pretty powerful. All of us entering our thoughts and feelings and data about the collard trials or the collard varieties we were given. Um, and in addition to all of those folks, there were eight sites around the country that received 20 of the varieties and grew them all out. And we were one of the lucky ones to get to do that. There were some others that I'll talk about a little bit. Um, Comfort Farms in Milledgeville, Georgia. Franny's Farm in Leicester, North Carolina, Ebony by Nature in Unumclaw, Washington, Mudbone Grown in Corbett, Oregon, uh, OSU in Aurora, Oregon, and Organic Seed Alliance in Chimicum, Washington, and last but certainly not least, of course, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange in Mineral, Virginia. Next slide. So I was able to work with our local University of Florida Field and Fork program. They have a really great program for undergraduate and graduate students that get to learn hands-on um, agricultural techniques and applications. And so they actually hired an intern to oversee this project. And it was really fun. It got to be a really great collaborative project of our nonprofit working with the University of Florida and we were able to open up this amazing project to the community to come and see the different collards and the students got some real world hands on in the soil experience doing scientific variety trials. Um, they followed Organic Seed Alliance's um, how to guide on running a, a trial and did it by the book and it was some really great uh, work that they did. Next slide. So these are just some of the pictures of us initially getting the collards in the ground. And we had a lot of fun. And that was the intern, Michaela, up in the right-hand corner. Next slide. Just some more pretty pictures. You can see the fields uh, coming along quite a bit. And we invited chefs and community members out. This is Chef Carl on the right. We work with him quite a bit. And he was blown away by collard diversity and eating raw collards out of the field and it was a lot of fun to see some of their faces uh, as they were able to taste and see all the collard diversity all in one space. Next slide. 
and we opened up a couple of collared field days. We invited the community to come out and see all the different varieties. We sent them out with little clipboards if they wanted to, and they took some notes for us, helping gather some of the feedback, um, making notes on the taste and you know uniformity and all the things that we were asking for in the seed linked trial. It was uh, really, really fun. And next slide, yeah, that's fine. And we even got in our little local news, the Gainesville Sun came and did an article, and this is my farmer friend, Lennon Fisher. He's a fifth generation black farmer in North Florida, and he didn't even know that there was this many collards. He was just kind of looking at me like, wow, I had no idea. So it was really a lot of fun to be able to share collards in such a fun way with chefs and farmers, gardeners, the general public who had just never thought about collards in this way. Next slide. And just some more fun pictures, everyone from little ginger boys to black chefs getting to celebrate and eat local collards with us. Next slide. And there are a lot of collards. That is the one thing we love about collards. Um, you know, we grow here year round in Florida, but things still do slow down a little bit in the winter. But one thing that doesn't slow down and never ceases to feed us is collards. And we were harvesting truckloads and carloads and sending it off to our youth program that was doing online cooking classes at the time with Chef Carl. So we got to feature some of these heirloom collards in their little take home kits. Next slide. So this is John Jackson and he runs Comfort Farms in Milledgeville, Georgia. It's about five hours due north from where I am. So John and I had started to become friends before this project started and uh, I reached out to him to see might he be interested in participating and the answer immediately was a resounding yes in all caps with a bunch of exclamation points via text. So I called him and uh, got him signed up and for those that don't know about John Jackson and Comfort Farms, I would encourage you to follow him on social media. He's an incredible black farmer, uh, former Navy vet, um, he's got a lot of great work that he's doing in Milledgeville by helping um, veterans that are trying to recover after the trauma of war and what they've been through through agriculture. And John is really connected to his heritage and crops and was a new seed saver on the scene. So he saved his very first collard seed with this project. And I try to help coach him through the process, which, you know, once you do it once, then you got it. Uh, next slide. So this is John and his old timey blue going to seed. And um, what was really interesting is that even though he's only five hours north of me, our old timey blue was not that gorgeous. We just don't get quite the cold that it does further north. And so it was just really interesting to see the regional and environmental variations that happen um, with collards. Next slide. And that's his son harvesting some greens and John, he, you know, he really gets out there on social media. He's got a lot of followers. So he was working with chefs to prepare some of these heirloom collards and he was inviting people out to his farm to see them. And he had people driving from hours away to come see these beautiful collards and take some home. And he, he would roll out a few varieties a week to keep people coming back and back again. So he was really clever with his marketing. Next slide. So um, there's no way I could possibly go through all the data results from the trial, um, but there is a link um, if someone wants to drop it in the chat or I'll do it once I'm off that summarizes all the results that came in through seed linked. And this is just an example of what you can see when you go in there. So I did a quick search for flavor across all hardiness zones and you can see quite a difference in flavor yellow cabbage collard. This affirmed my bias. The first time I ever tasted this, I was like, this is the best tasting collard I've ever had. And it came out uh, pretty high. And then you can see good old Georgia, that's kind of the commercial standard is down at the bottom. Um, but anyhow, you can go through all sorts of traits for your different zones and you can find which ones you might wanna try for yourself. And to me, I think the power in this data is that it really shows how interesting diversity can be that different people have different standards for what they want to grow and what they find interesting acceptable fun um, whether you're a farmer or gardener and depending on where you grow and uh, what your conditions are different varieties might be good for you so it's really fun if you're a data nerd and you like to get little charts like this i highly recommend you um, go over to that link that we'll share with you and you can noodle around in there and see what varieties you like 
So as part of this project, we ended up hooking up with Lane Salmon from the Culinary Breeding Network in the Pacific Northwest. And for those of you who don't follow the work that Lane and the Culinary Breeding Network does, I highly recommend you do. They just have such great programs for uh, doing outreach and celebrating local food. And she was working on putting together a virtual series of the Winter Vegetable Sagra. Um, because everything was going online with the pandemic, um, that's how her programs were shifting. And so we kind of worked our way into having a collared week. And so thanks to Lane, we were really able to pull together an amazing uh, four day in a row series of collared programming online. I think we've got a few slides of those. Next slide. This was the cute little collared poster she put together showing all the different varieties. Next slide. And these were some of our stars in the lineup for Collard Week. And you can watch all of these videos. They're on YouTube on the Culinary Breeding Network channel. So we had Michael Twitty talking about the history and culture around collards. Amira Mitchell from True Love Seeds and now Sista Seeds talking about seed stewardship and how to save collard seeds. Of course, Mama Ira. Uh, and John Jackson, who I mentioned earlier, spoke about his experience with collards and what they mean to him. And then Ashley Shante kind of blew us away with new ideas around using collards in the kitchen. Next slide. And that was me visiting John Jackson during Collard Week and broadcasting my session live, freezing cold inside of his high tunnel while the farm was in full action. That was a lot of juggling, but it was a lot of fun. And that's it for me. I'm gonna pass the mic on to Chris from Utopian Seed Project. Thank you, Melissa. Hey all, my name is Chris Smith. I'm the executive director of the Utopian Seed Project. I used to say that I was the, the youngest nonprofit kind of collaborator on this project, but now that Ujama's jumped on board and they launched officially just this year, then um, then I'm not the youngest anymore. So I don't know what that means for me. Um, so I, I uh, was lucky enough to be one of the full trial sites, which was super exciting, and also one of the, the core organizers of the project. And I just wanted to take a moment right at the beginning to just to share a few thoughts on collaboration in general and how it's worked here. And then I'm going to jump into some of our uh, social media and outreach successes that we've had with this project. And one thing that's kind of stuck in my mind, what was stuck in my mind for the whole um, project has been something that Dr. Cynthia Greenlee told me a long time ago. And she said, before you can have successful collaboration, you have to have community. And I don't think I really knew what she meant when she first said that to me, but uh, I've thought about it a lot. And I think to me, what that means is when you are building community, then it's often a case that you are, are giving without expecting to receive. And it's very much like outreach and support and relationship building. Um, and often when we launch into a collaboration, certainly if it's like a, a cold collaboration, you're just reaching out to someone and saying, hey, let's collaborate. Then um, you sometimes may be thinking, you know, what, what can I get out of this collaboration? So I think when you're community building, it's more about the other people you're working with. And sometimes with collaboration, it can be uh, what you can get out of it. And so if you jump straight into collaboration without that community, then you don't have any of those prerequisites that I think make a good collaboration, things like uh, mutual respect and understanding of each other and also shared values. And that all comes from the community building. So if you're thinking about launching a collaborative project, I would maybe caution or, or suggest or encourage you to maybe put the work into building relationships and community before jumping straight into some kind of collaborative project. And that's actually like evidenced uh, pretty well by Seed Savers Exchange. If I think back on like the history, um, they, they were very supportive of some of my work before I was doing anything with the Utopian Seed Project. They shared a lot of okra varieties with me and asked for nothing in return. And so when this collaborative opportunity with the Alum Collar Project came up, then it felt very natural to start working with them. And I think we already understood each other. So I just kind of wanted to share that personal experience because I think it's really valuable um, to go into collaborations where there's like this win-win attitude and everybody wants everyone else to succeed with what they're doing. Uh, okay, next slide. 
So uh, just quickly to show you my farm, this is uh, the Franny's farm site where we had all 20 varieties. This is my daughter who helped me plant them all and, and document them as we went forward. Uh, we can jump to the next slide. Um, and then one thing that we do at the Utopian Sea Project is we kind of uh, are set up to explore and celebrate and educate around uh, biodiversity and really linking that to uh, climate resilience. And if we can increase biodiversity in our food and farming systems, then hopefully we can have a better ability to withstand multiple shocks, but including climate shocks. And so that's one of my personal motivations for being a part of this collaboration is that we get to have access and explore and continue to celebrate the beautiful diversity that's on display through this colored collection. And this is just one of the photographs we took. This is all 20 varieties from that uh, trial plus one additional variety that we threw in from our own collection. Um, and it, I think it's just beautiful to see them all together. Uh, we can jump forward. Uh, and then I'm lucky enough to have Chef Ashley Shanti, who Melissa referenced on my board, uh, and she lives in Asheville. So Ashley has been extremely uh, engaged in this project. Somebody said this earlier in, in the presentation, but uh, Ashley grew up in, in Virginia, uh, had collards as part of her upbringing, and yet when she came to the field, and saw all the different varieties and started tasting them all, she was blown away by what was actually available, but isn't represented in the marketplace. So that's a big part of the work that we're trying to do. And it's been awesome to have that kind of like, uh, very experienced culinary advisor walking the roads with me, picking green leaves, tasting them, enjoying the sweet ones or the bitter ones and saying, oh, this would be great for this and this would be great for that. And so just having that kind of like, heightened awareness around the culinary aspect of these colors has been really exciting and, and has really helped with our outreach. So um, Ashley has been a bit of a superstar uh, in this project as well. Okay, next slide. So what I quickly want to go through with you is one of, one of the big benefits, I think, of having a broad collaboration with lots of people involved, and that's the ability to do really effective uh, outreach and engagement, because basically, every organization that's collaborating all has their own audiences and so by having a shared message that you can push out through multiple platforms then you can have pretty quick and effective reach around a single message in in our case the lm colored project so um i'm i'm going to share some of the ways that we've tried to achieve that uh, just to maybe offer some ideas and inspiration for any of your own projects we can jump forward um the first thing we did and and this is maybe worth stating very like directly collaborations can be one organization reaching out to someone else and saying hey let's collaborate and that's kind of like a lead organization and then these people that they bring into their project but the lm color project to me has always felt like something where multiple organizations are truly meeting in the middle to achieve a shared objective so it's not really owned by any one organization we, we are truly democratic collaborators on this single thing in the center and because of that we didn't want to have it housed on seed savers website or on the utopian sea projects website we wanted it to be its own thing and so it was very important for us to have we, we got the url elum colored project no sorry elum colors um and we set up this website and so this is kind of like our uh digital ground zero where you can go to and see everything uh, that's going on and hopefully from here learn how to get involved what we're up to uh, and that type of thing i would say um on the on the back side of that it's great that we've got a website but now a group of people that have come together and all have their own projects going on have created something that now needs to be managed and that's maybe one of the biggest challenges of these types of collaborations is it's like an extra thing to do and the more things you create or the more things you want to achieve the more work there is and i'm doing my utopian sea project stuff and melissa's doing working food and ira's running a sea company and we've got sea savers exchange doing all sorts of stuff benita's trying to get ujama up and running uh, so we're all pulled in our own directions and prioritizing the island color project to be something that we find time to work on, especially when funding is limited, can, can be a major challenge. Okay, 
so other, other social outreach efforts, we launched the Alum Call Project, um, Facebook group. Facebook groups, uh, I, I could go either way on. They are great because you can have inter-community communication. So it's not just us speaking to people, it's people speaking to each other. And we've seen evidence of that on the Alum Call Project, especially when the 2020 trial was active. It was really great to see people supporting each other and connecting with their, in their own regions. Uh, we're not, as, as an organizing group, we're not very active on the LM Color Project Facebook group. And so Facebook groups can kind of die fairly quickly if there's not engagement on there. So um, it's there, I would join it. People are currently posting photographs um, and asking questions, but it's not as active as it could be, but certainly a, a good resource. Uh, next slide. We were uh, more in, more successful, I would say, on Instagram for, for no particular reason apart from um, the collards and the diversity within the collards are really visually appealing. And so I think a lot of people got engaged and inspired because we're able to show off that diversity. So um, same sort of thing as the group. We during 2020 when we were being very active with Collard Week and the trials, then Instagram was kind of kicking off. 2021, we haven't done as much with the Instagram profile and it's kind of slowed down a little bit as well. So it's a tool there. It's primed to do the next project, but again, it takes somebody to continue managing it for it to continue to be successful. Next slide. Uh, that we just um one thing with instagram i'm sure most people know is you know hashtags are a good way to kind of one get exposure and two follow certain topics so we've created various hashtags under our different program areas like color week college 2020 college trials that type of thing so just another engagement tool really next slide um and then i i guess this is an example of what i was saying about like the the visual um stunningness of some of these collards is, is a great way just to like show people what exists and then allow them to get excited and share it around and some of these photographs are just like wow there's just so much to explore within these collards and it can be very uh, exciting and inspiring okay and then coming around to uh, the collard week collard week brought on a, an additional collaborator through the culinary breeding network as melissa was describing um we didn't have our own youtube channel presence and we didn't really want to create one because outside of colored week we didn't really know what we were going to do in terms of video production so all of those colored week videos were hosted under the culinary breeding network and they're currently available there as a playlist and we have them embedded on our website um i, I think the the additional outreach to culinary breed network was fantastic because they've got their own outreach network and they're very well known and popular and so by working with those it kind of gave us this additional broader reach so if you don't have any limits to the people that you're willing to work with then i kind of feel as long as it's manageable in terms of organization just bringing on more partners only benefits the project next slide i wanted to kind of wrap up this this section by just sharing some of the successes with our press outreach. Most of this was specifically around Colored Week. Colored Week was kind of a good narrative for us to end 2020 because we were able to bring in a lot of awesome speakers. We had a very clear message around uh, celebrating and educating colored history, colored growing, and these colored varieties. And so we were able to basically blast out a press release and throw it out to all of our networks, including the core partners and the Culinary Breed Network. And we, we picked up a fair amount of national attention uh, for this project, which, you know, the more people recognizing collards and the potential, the, the better we're able to do our work. So we can go through these fairly quickly, Melanie, but I just wanted to show some of the different articles that we had. You'll notice this, uh, the picture of the 21 varieties altogether became a popular picture. And that, that speaks again, just to some, some of the outreach can be so simple just to because people just don't know that this type of diversity exists they're just not even aware of it so just to show a picture of 21 different varieties is enough to blow a lot of people's minds 
this is Melanie, who's clicking through the slides for us today, um, who wrote a wonderful article for Pacific Northwest. Uh, it, that's, that's been another fun thing of this project, is that while we're largely focused on the Southeast in terms of just the people part of the project, by working with Organic Seed Alliance and the Culinary Breeding Network, we were able to like push out into the West Coast, Pacific Northwest, and Melanie was one of our 20 variety growers and has been a great part of the project going forward. And then these are kind of just, you know, examples of articles that we can kind of jump forward through. Um, so various levels, you know, Food Tank, Atlas Obscura, some podcasts, some radio exposure. Um, and again, all over the country, Ira's obviously written a lot of books and is a great writer and has, has written some articles herself. Um, I've got a cat interfering, apologies. Um, some local press like Melissa got for our project with Ashley Shante. Um, and then back to conferences, like what we've got good exposure here at the Organic Seed Alliance conference, but a lot of the agricultural conferences have allowed us to speak. We spoke at Seed Savers Exchange Conference. This was CFSA, so that's allowed us to, to really get the message out to farmers. And then I think this might be the last one. Um, this is actually the Seed Savers Exchange uh, publication that they put out and they've managed to spotlight some of those trial partners. So it's been an opportunity for us, not just to be inward looking at what we're doing, but also to spotlight the farmers that we're working with. And I guess that's really important to me and I know everyone in the project as well is to continue to kind of like just spread out uh, what we're doing and who can benefit from these colored varieties. And then I think we're passing over to Kristen to speak about some of the stuff we did in 2021. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so as Chris was mentioning, we had all of this beautiful buildup, all of this activity between Collard Week and the press that we were getting. And then um, my colleague, Nora, who you can see in this picture here, who is heading up the Collard Project, or the Seed Savers connection to the Collard Project at the time, um, felt very strongly that in order to move collectively forward, that we needed to collectively si decide which direction to move forward. And the project, um, the project decided that that was important to, to decide together how best to move forward with this project. Slide. And so uh, the leaders, many of whom are on this call, asked uh, all of the participants, would you like to gather with us um, and together dream of how we can move this project forward, what that looks like, and how we can best um, hold each other and hold this project as we move forward. And so they put out an ask and slide. So many partners said yes. And together traveled, slide, outside of Asheville to Chris's home farm at Franny's farm, um, which also very conveniently happens to be an event venue as well. And we were able to gather there to together dream collectively about the future of the project. We only had one day together, and so we planned it very thoughtfully. Um, I was brought into the project as a facilitator and illustrator, and together um, well, the group uh, went through a full day of dreaming and scheming. Um, next slide. We asked questions like, what, uh, what are we meant to do here? Why are we doing what we do? Who's involved? Who might want to be involved but isn't here? Um, next slide. And we cross-pollinated a lot. We came up with so many incredible ideas by sharing space together and um, kind of bouncing off of each other's ideas and kind of creating a collective momentum for this project. We thought of everything from heirloom collared uh, driving tours to um, collared art, more seed trials, so many different um, directions that this project might go. And it was so energizing and relationship building to spend this time together. Next. Uh, we took a moment to step back and identify the different themes 
that were coming up in our different ideas and um, enthusiasms. And education, storytelling, and justice um, continued to come up, as well as ways to kind of market not only our project, but um, market collards in general. In the afternoon, we felt it was really important to do what we call open space, which is where um, the, the leaders of the gathering don't decide what to talk about, but everyone at the gathering, if they feel called to host a conversation about a certain topic, that um, this was space to do that. So again, in collaborative seed projects, um, often there are, there's kind of maybe a group that's kind of a core group that might be holding all it together in, in the realm of communicating with other partners and just kind of collectively holding a project and to bring people in. And, um, and the importance of having focus time of, of intentional questions to discuss together, but also open time of what does the group want to discuss? What's bubbling up as we're having these conversations? And this is when we really got to have some juicy conversations about like, how do we uplift the people who were separated from SEED? Or how are we telling the SEED stories? Um, mapping different partnerships that we're doing. Uh, so this was really valuable time. And it was always so hard to stop our juicy conversations that we had going. Um, we'll do next slide. And we ended the day with being able to articulate our shared values with the project. So after a day of eating together and uh, having conversations and enjoying time on the farm together um, and building those relationships, we were really able to articulate those shared values, which at the end of the day is really what helps guide a collaborative seed project forward. So we had one beautiful day together. This is our group picture of everyone who was able to attend. We had everyone from seed growers. Uh, we had some folks from the USDA. We had um, a fashion designer, chefs, all sorts of folks. And um, we stepped away with new and renewed interest in specific projects and people who stepped forward saying, yes, I want to help champion this project. Um, we also had really valued community discussions, as I just mentioned and relationship building. We uh, were inspired to start crafting a vision statement for our project. And after a little bit of space from our gathering and um, some reflection, we were able to really identify three key focus areas, which are celebrating collard history, promoting collards in the kitchen, and growing heirloom collards. And I do want to mention that none of this would have been possible without a grant from the 1772 Foundation and, su and support from Southern SARE as well. So, um, time together felt so important and we we're so grateful to be able to have the funding to make it happen and come together and do that and think that it was really a worthwhile investment. So just for fun, feel free to put in the chat what would help you better become acquainted with heirloom collards. That was one of our our big juicy questions that we were imagining at our gathering. So since we all have you as a captive audience, Feel free to pop that in the chat. I've, I see a uh, oral history. I see, oh, someone said everything. Oh, that's not fair. That's very fair. Just kidding. We love them all. A and B, E, E, A. Oh, fun. This is great. OK, I'm going to print this off later. Tally them up. Thank you, um, momentary focus group. Very good. <laughs> fun, 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 fun. All right, next. So if you'd like to get involved with the Heirloom Collard Project or um, see what we're going to do next, here are some ideas of how you can get in touch. Of course, we want everyone to grow some beautiful heirloom collards this next year, or at least cook them. You can follow us on social media. At, at Heirloom Collards is our Instagram handle or check out our website and explore the different collard varieties that are there. Even just familiarizing yourself with the different ones um, is the a next step that's really great. Of course, you can always watch Collard Week. That link has already been put in the chat, um, but Google will help you find it as well. All right, next we're gonna switch over to Bonita, I believe. 
Yes, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me tell you about my uh, opportunity, the joy I found in my life to get involved with this project. Uh, my work uh, prior to COVID was with the middle high school and college age students on uh, STEM careers, uh, seeking to increase the number of youth, uh, minority and underserved youth in their STEM careers. But we always had to make it relevant. And how do you make this relevant? You got to do it through the lens of food because everybody's got to eat. It's the way we tell stories. So um, our youth uh, had two initiatives. One was related to clean water because we are in um, unceded Piscataway and Akaki territory in the uh, Washington, D.C. and Virginia area. But it was also to help deal with food insecurity. So uh, our young people set up an online seed store and a place where they could set up, uh, where they could sell starts, native trees and bushes as a part of their work. When COVID came along and hit and shut down everything we wanted to do. So by luck, I heard about the Co-op Gardens Commission. The Co Cooperative Gardens Commission was a group of about 2,000 2, citizens that came together to deal with the emergency, uh, the breakdown in the food distribution system due to uh, COVID. And as we uh, began to uh, organize way in which we could get seeds out, as many seeds as possible, we began to think about what was really important. Well, one of the benefits we had was so many of the fine seed companies, heirloom seed companies donated free seeds to uh, co-op gardens, and we were able to distribute those uh, now to uh, 300 seed hubs around the country, which we gave free heirloom seeds to anyone, uh, particularly, you know, with emphasis on underserved communities. And people were very excited about getting these free seeds, but there was a challenge, and that was the seeds that people of color were requesting were not available from donations for the most part. What did they want? Well, first on the list was collard, uh, okra, mustard greens, collard, uh, uh, turnip greens, uh, black eyed peas, grouted peas, lima beans, all the things that make up the Southern uh, food. So it was a struggle. Uh, and uh, so with help of uh, Nate Kleiman and some other friends, we decided we had to grow our own seeds. You hear about that a little bit later because we ended up starting an uh, heirloom seed company with the focus on culturally important seeds. So let me go back. My good friend, Reggie, who was sitting uh, with me uh, on the seed distribution working group with Co-op Gardens, uh, called one day and asked me, did I want to get involved with the Heirloom College Project? And it's like, well, college yum, you know, what do you want? So she asked if I could find six uh, uh, gardeners that would be interested in participating in the college trials. I was like, yes, of course. So the first six people I called all said yes. And for the most part, they were Af African-American women who, uh, who grew up with a garden in their yard or on a farm, but because they had moved to the cities and had gone to college and maybe got a law degree or became a teacher or a principal, no longer garden, but COVID gave them an opportunity to do something they really needed to do, to deal with the issues facing our community, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, and a bunch of heart uh, health related uh, illnesses that these educated people knew could best be treated with an improvement in their diet. And what COVID gave them was the time and what co-op garden uh, gave them was seeds. And so um, at a random, I think, um, uh, Melissa talked about it. These growers received three uh, varieties at random of college that they grew out, and they were looking for things like taste and all of that. Uh, everybody got their seeds except for me. And I will always believe that somebody knew that collards were coming to my house and somebody stole my collard greens out of the mail. I can't prove it. I just think that's what happened. But it turned out that I did uh, get some starts and I was able to go out a few collard. I got them late in the season, they struggled. But the most important thing was people got excited about collard. And I've got to tell you that 
um, as along the middle passage as African Americans, so many of us feel that we have we were lost, we were orphans, and uh, we were sent away, and we didn't we lost our culture and our tradition. But one of the things that collard is collards represent one of the few traditions that has survived, and that is New Year's Day, New Year's dinner. What do you have to have? You got to have collard greens and black eyed peas, if nothing else. So the symbolic representation of collard greens and the role that they play in the African American family, in spite of you know 400 years of slavery, those things have survived. And so if you want to reach out to the community, relevancy is the number one thing that you need to have. And the project, it was relevant, it was important, and it's also quite delicious. So we got an opportunity to present. And I must say that the website and the way it was designed was the number one way to get people excited about collard. So you go to the Heirloom uh, uh, Project uh, website and you see all this beautiful uh, biodiversity. And if there's one thing that's true about my people, African-American people, is we have that same kind of uh, layout. I mean, we range in everything from dark skin to light skin, tall, dark. Biodiversity that you see in collard is also reflected in our, our roots in Africa. So collards look like my community and are definitely relevant and delicious. The idea that this biodiversity was lost was actually an incentive for our growers to get involved in growing more collard. We need to bring back the discussion of how collards came to be one of the crops that African Americans enslaved people developed to be what it is as a hallmark in, in Southern cuisine. It's truly American and it's truly African American. And I want to thank the scholars who worked on that, that proved that and continue to make uh, collars important. So one of the things that Ujama has been able to do, our focus has been on these rare things that are culturally important that people really want. They want to, uh, to get their hands on things that are meaningful for them. And we want to rega regain our heritage as agriculturalists. So Ujama seeks to reclaim our seed heritage, to steward these seeds, bring them forward, and make them available for future generations. What's better than collars? I'm sorry. Collars are the bomb. So as I go out recruiting new growers and new gardeners to work with us, and I always tell them, well, there's a few things we have to raise, and one of them you have to grow is collard. I know probably uh, some of y'all are saying they have to raise collard. Well, yeah, because they also need to raise okra, and they need to raise um, a, a peas, a field peas. You know, black-eyed peas, rice peas. Yes, all of these are, are major steps in regaining and reclaiming our heritage, along with sorghum and watermelon. Oh, yeah. These are things that every Southerner knows about, but now we can own it. It belongs to us. It gives us an opportunity to learn, to study, and to uh, express our, ourselves creatively. Uh, one of the beauties of uh, the uh, revisioning that we did in Asheville is that I don't know where they found these chefs, but my dear, they came up with some amazing chefs. On the first night we were there, I think we had a 12 or 14 course meal that was collards. And on the second day, it was a 17 course meal with collard greens featured in every one of the, um, the courses. Let me tell you, yes, collard green dessert. It was amazing. Oh, and I got to throw in that there was some um, beautiful uh, okra seeds that were uh, fermented. They were yummy also. That's coming. Uh, just letting you know that this is a project that's relevant and it's important. I have new growers uh, that come in every day and they all want to know when can we start it? When can we get going, going uh, uh, collars? So we have, uh, we will be trialing collars all over the country and internationally. Yes, yesterday we had some uh, Jamaicans that came in that have, uh, are in the, um, the mountains, the blue mountains of Jamaica that says we can grow collars here. Collars are part of our, our culture. I also talked to um, the Angolan uh, organ, uh, organization, the Angolan government. I'm working on a project with them. And, and they've heard that there is a relationship between Lusophone countries 
those people that went from Angola to Brazil and to uh, other Portuguese speaking uh, colonies, that there is a relationship there. So now they're excited to explore their relationship, if there is any a historical relationship to color. Everybody wants them. We're going to be eating them. We're going to be trialing them uh, with the Federation of Southern uh, Collectives and many other organizations around the country are going to get involved. Uh, we're reclaiming collards, and I want to thank you. And please, I still need some collared earrings. We had uh, somebody, I think it was you, Melissa, somebody's wearing collared earrings. And you know, fashion, the, the Greek connection with the AKA, you know, this is this is us, and it's something that we see a future in, and we feel that we can develop markets to sell uh, all these uh, beautiful varieties and to create uh, uh, revenue for uh, farmers who will grow these varieties out and introduce those into their local farmers markets, build demand. So eventually, uh, all the grocery stores will have to carry multiple varieties of collards. So uh, thank you very much for including me. Uh, I think now uh, I'd like to share with you uh, some insight from some of our growers. We ask all our uh, growers, anybody that comes into uh, Ujama has to tell a seed story. And this is a, a little clip of some growers telling their college stories. Okay, give me the thumbs up if you see it working. It looks good so far. What do collards mean to me? <sighs> collards to me are a reminder of the great women in my family. My grandmothers and great grandmothers cooking bringing sustenance to our home. Some of my first memories uh, as a child is clearing a pot of greens with my grandma. And we, I mean, I thought I was special. We'd sit there and eat a pot of greens and, and talk for hours. And until it was done, it was gone. And I found out that all of my cousins and siblings, each one of us at some point in time had sat with Grandma Gert and cleared an entire massive pot of greens and just talked. Collard greens are a reminder of those moments. My grandmother liked mustard and turnips. And, and I think collards, and collards as well, I think collards for me, I almost exclusively cook collards. Um, and I think it's my way of honoring all of these things and yet still finding my own addition to the family pot. Um, I hope that my children will use both. I mean, I, I do use, turnip and mustard, but there's just something special about collars. I don't know. Um, my kids like both. Um, maybe that's the beauty of the generations to come is, you know, maybe that's what they'll remember. You know, one of the things they'll remember is mom making collard greens and how she made greens a little different than grandma and great grandma. And yet, but still great, you know, with, with, with great sustenance, love nonetheless. That's my thought on collard greens. Jim Embry here. Hello from our family farm here in Madison County, Kentucky, which we have cared for and farmed organically since the early 1800s. I come from five generations of agrarian intellectual activists who have all used greens in one fashion or another. We have utilized greens as medicinal plants like 
plantain, and witch hazel. We have gathered wild greens such as poke, dandelion, and lamb's quarter. And we have seeded greens like mustard, kale, and collards. We have a special affection for collards because they grow so big, they can feed so many people, and we can harvest them from spring to winter. Here is my winter kale uh, collards here. So may the forest of collards be with you. Bye. Hi, I'm Sonia Harris and I'm from South Jersey. I love collard greens. That is one vegetable I cannot do without. I am so proud to be able to grow them for my family and for myself every single year. It's important because as a person of African descent, there's not a lot that we have that ties us back to um, our actual tribe, our actual country, where, pinpointed where in Africa our genealogy begins. However, we know that we are united by foods and it's so important for, for me when I was little, you know, I would sit down with my mom and you had to wash those greens. You had to soak them in the sink. You had to wash them to get the sand or grit as she called it. Can't have no grit in your greens. And we'd slice them. And she taught me how to roll them and slice them. Or the time I was with my aunt and my aunt would say, oh no, honey, we have to cut that rind out. So you had to cut that rind out of the greens. Then we could slice them up or being with my grandma and my grandma would always soak hers with some apple cider vinegar and she knew we didn't eat pork so she would always cook hers with turkey neck and um, it, just being able to sit with the women who were in my family and and take that journey is what connects me so much to this crop that sustained my ancestors, my ancestors who were enslaved and also my ancestors who were growing this back somewhere in Western Africa. I love growing collard greens because it reminds me of my childhood. Collard greens have been a staple in my family. It's something my grandmother cooked. It's something my grandfather cooked. It's something my mom cooked and my dad cooks. It's easy to grow. I've grown it since I was a child. Um, it's a beautiful plant. Some of the best flowers for honeybees and bumblebees. It's flexible. The flexibility of using collard greens in Asian foods and American foods, Central American foods, and uh, Southeast Indian foods. It has a lot of flexibility. Um, it's great for cooking stews. I love growing collard green seeds, collecting and saving those. I like sharing them with family. I like sharing them with friends and neighbors and some of the cooperative groups that I work with, uh, one being specifically Ujama Farm. Hi, I'm Samaria. I'm Blaine. And we are the owner operators of Juniper's Garden, which is a herb and veggie farm in Brandywine, Maryland. And we are very excited to be a part of the Heirloom Collar Project. I'm looking forward to possibly having two, if not three varieties to steward. Collards are very important to traditional African American folk food lore, as well as foodways across the South and in the US more broadly. And I love to cook. And my new favorite cookbook is called Jubilee. And Jubilee has dozens of recipes with collard greens in them. And fresh collard greens after the first frost of fall are the best tasting. And I'm very excited to be a part of the project. Hi, I'm Diane and I live in Southern Maryland. What do collards mean to me? Collards mean joy. I have had the opportunity, thanks to Ujama Farming, to go plant five different varieties of collards 
at various community gardens. One of varieties I was able to plant at my church garden, William Alexander Collards. I also have the opportunity to volunteer at the food pantry at my church. Well, we have a couple folks that just love collars. They love greens of any kind. I had the opportunity to share my first harvest of the William Alexander collards with one of our, our clients. And the next time he came to visit, he said, remember those collards you gave me? He said, they were the best collards I ever tasted. The joy on his face just made me so happy that I was able to share with the produce that was given to me. So I look forward to being able to harvest more collards and share produce with the people in local food banks and local food pantries and spread the joy. Um, if you're interested in uh, working with Ujama, we are still uh, looking for people who are interested in growing out these varieties. But to the broader group, we have to build markets for these. We have to build interest. I mean, you heard Diane could name that variety of collard greens. We want everybody to have their favorite green or maybe one. Uh, I was blessed to get a donation of seeds from a Snake River. They have one called Sexy Mama Collard Greens. I just love that. And as we identify growers, they are coming up with their own family heirlooms. We've begun something that's powerful and exciting. And we look forward to a future with collard greens in the mix and on the table. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benita. Thank you for sharing those wonderful stories. So now we are to the question and answer portion of our panel here today. And as that begins to get kicked off, um, I do want to mention that the survey that you weighed in on earlier came back a clear tie between wanting to know more about collard subtypes and also wanting to hear more about oral histories of collards. And actually, we do have an update on something that the project is working on regarding subtypes. And I thought I'd let Chris speak to that for a minute. Yeah, um, we, I feel like I'm always saying Sarah funded. Sarah, thank you, Sarah. Um, Sarah funded a collared magazine project that Melissa and I have been kind of co-project managing and we've contracted with Dr. Cynthia Greenlee, who's an incredible editor and writer um, here in the South to kind of edit this collection of articles, illustrations, pictures, poetry, just a beautiful collection of different uh, colored uh, projects. And one of the things that we did was we worked with Dr. Mark Farnham, who was the geneticist that Ira mentioned uh, down in Charleston, who originally grew out all the different colored varieties. Uh, and we asked him to create uh, descriptions for various colored subtypes. And then we're having Kristen, who's a talented illustrator, illustrate those subtypes with a kind of a classic variety that represents that subtype. So it's exciting to hear that you all wanted that because it's pretty much almost done. We'll be publishing it first in this colored magazine, which we'll definitely let you know about um, when that's ready later in this year. But then we're also hoping to turn that into other resources that people could share online, maybe a poster, that type of thing. So definitely something to keep your eyes on as we uh, move forward with that project. So if you want that collared subtype guide, follow us on Instagram or Facebook or keep checking back on our website. Another reason to stay in touch with the project. Thank you. We did have a question to kick us off that came in much earlier in the presentation. I did see it and it's asking, is there any discussion of perennial collards? Would someone on our panel like to speak to that? I, I could speak to that if nobody else wants to. Um, so there is discussion of the perennial collards. Um, they're sometimes called like uh, tree collards is another description for them. 
they're quite popular um kind of west coast southwest um and there's actually an awesome organization which i'm sure melanie is about to drop a link in the chat for me called i think it's called project tree or dot com and they one sell perennial collard cuttings and seeds and they have fantastic resources for growing them it's not something that's like directly part of this collection of lm collards that we're working with although some of them do display various you know uh, tendencies to go to seed and, and could be just you know I, I had some colleagues in my field that didn't go to seed in the second year and have gone all the way through another winter so you know they're potentially going towards perennial um so yeah we're definitely aware of them we definitely talk about them currently we're not like actively actively engaging with perennial collards but um but that resource is fantastic if you want to learn more about them thank you chris I do want to invite anyone watching, if you do have a question about collaborative seed projects or specifically our project, you can put that question in the chat. Um, or if you prefer to raise your hand, I don't know, Melanie, can they come off of mute to ask it or is it best in the chat? Yeah, um, I think they're gonna have to use the raise hand feature. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, Rebecca just said yes, they can unmute. Okay. Sounds really good. All right, so I'm seeing a question, are there existing projects or some in the planning to involve school gardens? Absolutely. So um, we are working with school gardens in Baltimore and uh, in Prince George's County. <clears throat> so far we've had 23 uh, schools sign up and each one of the schools will be adopting a collard. We haven't talked about this yet, but we really hope to build this out that everybody uh, can identify one collard that maybe require them to grow a couple or three, maybe several collards and then decide which one is their collard. But we do have schools um, that are signed up to grow a collard this season. They'll be planting uh, in the fall. There is no reason why uh, if we can make more college seeds available, we can't uh, donate those to, uh, to co-op gardens and make those available to more uh, schools on a national basis. I would like to add to that and just sort of remind folks to something Chris said earlier about this project not being necessarily held by one organization, but being super collaborative that this involves y'all. So if you want to do anything with youth or school gardens, you can absolutely get these seeds and run your own trials or have cooking classes, like whatever you want to do. Um, we definitely incorporated collards into our youth programs. And we had a couple schools that were part of the trial. One of the schools just down the street from us, uh, it's the farm to school to work hub. And they work with a number of high school students with different abilities. And they did the trial they got super excited about looking at the differences and harvesting the varieties and cooking with them in the kitchen. And the slide I showed earlier, we had also been harvesting them for our youth cooking classes. So there's lots of opportunities there, whether it's just growing them and observing them and enjoying them to, you know, folks want to do some citizen science and have kids looking at the intricate differences of the different collared varieties, like the sky's the limit. And it's a lot of fun working with kids. They let you see things you didn't see before. Benjamin, I see your question kind of asked something similar of how to engage youth with um, maybe STEM skill building and entrepreneurialism building. And I just um, defer to what Melissa just said about the potential for others um, to bring interest into this project and to, and to partner with the project in that way. So. Um, there's so many ways to connect people with collards and, and it takes us all. So if you want to get involved with the project and, and champion collards in your community in that way, do get in touch. Um, we did have a question um, wondering that they're saying that someone in a different session was asking about black rot resistance in cabbage. And this person's wondering if black rot resistance in collards and if it's a common problem in the southeast.
I don't really know. Do we have our pathologist that was on the earlier Southeast call on the line? I saw it once on a collard we had, and we took that poor thing out of the field right away and it never spread anywhere, but I can't speak enough to that. I don't know if the other collard growers, not just us, but anyone on the line has thoughts. I've also not come across it as a direct problem that I've been dealing with. Um, I imagine as you go more towards, you know, the the warmer, more humid states like Georgia or whatnot, then maybe maybe you'd see more of it. But I, I always, I'm just further enough north that I seem to get away with a lot of those types of things. We did have someone respond in the chat that yes, black rot is common in Georgia. So I hope that is helpful to you. Um, there's been questions of have we thought of or started developing curriculum for schools. Um, there were a lot, I will just say there were so many ideas to, of ways to connect people to collars that were generated during our visioning session. And um, I think it, correct me if I'm wrong, fellow teammates, but I think the ones that will go forward are the ones that have champions that have time and, and space to work on them and, and be the leader to pull them forward. Um, does anyone else want to speak a little bit more to that? I, I feel like different ideas that might come up of ways to connect people to collards. Oh, yeah. Jim had some really good ideas too. He was talking about involvement with the black church and uh, Jim, I think that it's very much in line with, uh, you know, with our work with Ujama that we maybe uh, become um, a partner to do some pilot program. I know uh, Church of God in Christ has a large garden project and there's no reason why they can't join us with the ultra cross uh, grow out that we're also doing uh, with the Utopian uh, a, a seed project. That's an exciting project in which they can actually learn just about everything you'd ever wanna know, but we're afraid to ask about collared seed breeding is the work that we're doing. So we are hopefully developing a whole curriculum around seed breeding. We're, we're um, planning on doing that with the Federation for Southern um, Cooperatives and have a demonstration farms around the, um, the country. Uh, but there's no reason why we can't make that uh, learning process online. There are several of the people who are in that um, in that video that we just showed our classroom teachers and they are working on uh, different ways. Uh, so I will throw it out to them. Uh, let's see if we can have at least, you know, a, a series of things that, that I talk about college role, the history of college as an African-American uh, food, but then all the culinary and scientific uh, things they can learn through the growing of college. I think it's boundless what we can accomplish. Can I add, can y'all hear me? Uh, yeah. I spoke Sunday uh, virtually to a Unitarian church up in uh, Chicago. And if we are, uh, uh, have read Leah Penniman's, um, I think part of her, end of her book, she describes her mom as being a Unitarian minister. Uh, but <laughs> I do a lot of talking to faith community folk about this idea of the spiritual aspect of of food agriculture from the planting of seeds to the spiritual practice to the growing the harvesting all the way to the composting these are all spiritual practices so i mentioned our brother heber brown that i spoke on a panel with a couple years ago and utilizing not just uh his group the black church food security network but faith community in general uh as getting folks to around their faith building <laughs> growing stuff, planting stuff. But also I wanted to leave a thought about something maybe a year from now. I spoke about three years ago up in Toronto, what was called the Parliament of Rural Religions. Uh, I did a talk about George Washington Carver. I was on a panel about food justice. I think uh, whether it's the Heirloom Collar Project, or other things that we're working on, we should be thinking about, it's gonna be in Chicago next year, 2023. It draws about 10,000 people from everywhere in the world. But of course, food and agriculture is an important intersect in that parliament. 
So let's be thinking about, you know, what kind of display, okay, <laughs> to be what I have uh, at that parliament, uh, what workshops we want to present, and so forth. That's the thought. Thank you, Jim. And on a slightly different note, I did have someone pop up and ask, what was the name of your farm? Could you share the name of your farm with us? Who, me? Yes. Oh, our farm is called the, uh, the Atris Baloo Farm, uh, who was my great, I live in the house now that was built by my great uncle, okay, from, from ammo boxes from the Army Depot. But, uh, but so his um, uh, parents were formerly enslaved, my great grandparents, okay. Uh, and uh, again, they were brought here, well, they, their, their parents were brought in 1800. Uh, so um, our uncle Atrus lived to be 100 years old. Uh, and back in those days, we have eight people in the family who were centenarians, okay? But anyway, so it's named in his honor, uh, was my great uncle, it's called the Atrus Baloo Farm. Thank you, we had someone asking in the chat. Um, yeah. Maybe now they'll be able to get in touch with you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we do have a question in the chat about the Ultra Cross and what the history and hopes is of that mix. Yeah, I can I can speak quickly to that. Um, so I was one of the trial sites for the all 20 varieties and then we had a 21st variety. So I had 21 varieties in the ground and, and we did a like a replicated block design where all the varieties were like intermixed with each other in blocks of 10 plants and basically what that meant was seed saving for pure seeds would have been extremely challenging because they are obligate outcrosses and insect pollinated and all these other things with the collards being right next to each other it would have been really hard to say pure seed so i never went into that project of growing those 21 varieties with the intention of saving seeds uh, but i did know and, and trust that Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and Seed Savers Exchange, you know, those varieties were well stewarded. So it wasn't like they were at risk seeds. Anyway, so I grew those collards. They were beautiful. We did tastings, et cetera. Some goats ate them. I cried in the corner. They came back. It was wonderful. And we went into winter and it got really, really cold. And we had a low of eight Fahrenheit and it took out maybe like 30 or 40% of the varieties in the field. They just died. And I realized that this was just a wonderful form of natural selection from this uh, really diverse population of collards that had all been allowed to interpollinate. So instead of not thinking of it as a seed saving project, I flipped my thinking on it and just allowed it to continue to grow and see which varieties survived that winter. Uh, once they started flowering, then, you know, as we knew, they all intercrossed and I saved seeds from just all the winter survivors. And so the ultra cross is this just extremely broad mix of genetics, parentage from those 21 heirloom varieties many of which had diverse genetics themselves. There was some very much, you know, not super uniformity like you see in modern varieties. Um, and we, through the Utopian Seed Project, we do these community seed selection projects where we send out seeds and encourage people to do their own selections and seed saving. And we do it as a, like a guided educational process. And so um, Seed Savers Exchange jumped on board uh, to help pack and distribute those seeds. And then Melissa at Working Food also distributed some. And now they're also available through the Experimental Farm Network and the Ujama seeds. So the seeds are now widely available. And my hope for those seeds is that people and communities will take them and plant them and, you know, just be, you know, these observant botanical gardeners and see which ones they fall in love with or which ones do well with their particular problems, whether it's disease pressure, heat tolerance, cold tolerance, flavor, you know, there's just so much opportunity within this broad mix for people to guide those varieties in whichever direction they want. And the reason they're called Ultra Cross because Melanie's right here is, was just a random, I think maybe even a satirical hashtag on Instagram when I posted a picture <laughs> of them. She was just like, Ultra Cross. And so that, that name kind of stuck. Uh, technically it's a composite cross in kind of like, botanical speak, but uh, we're, we're calling them the ultra cross collards. Yeah, I think somebody asked about additional varieties. Um, uh, 
just to be honest with you, uh, there's an ultra cross uh, okra as well. And uh, Tyler, uh, you're asking about history or whoever's asked about history. So many of these crops, the seed stories are remarkable um, to tell how these uh, seeds journey. There's a, a beautiful uh, black eyed pea. And I know uh, Nate is on uh, the line. Nate, can you talk about uh, that uh, fish IP and and uh, just share uh, briefly uh, why it's such an important um, seed in our family? You don't know seeds are relatives. That's why I'm calling it our family. <laughs> Is Nate there? Um, this fish, uh, this uh, fish eye pepper is one of the oldest uh, 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 seeds that was followed uh, from enslaved people all the way across the country. So uh, it was grown by Amira Mitchell. Many of you know her because of her incredible work as a teacher. She and uh, has worked for True Love Seeds and as part of the um, uh, uh, the Ujama project is all in its growing uh, seeds. Uh, in addition, the uh, rice pea, uh, that's really important. So as we do the homework, hopefully we'll be able to tell these things. Nate, can you get on? Can you unmute yourself and talk about that seed? He's, it seems like he's having trouble unmuting himself. Nate, you should be good now. Give it a try. I guess he's still having trouble. Not working. All right. So uh, there's this is the work we're doing. We're gonna follow. We're gonna go through the rabbit hole. We're gonna trace down these things. Uh, you know, there again, uh, Utopian Seeds has tropical uh, uh, seeds and tropical plants that they're working on. I um, I know that also. Seed Savers has uh, many heirloom varieties that come from the tropics. And so as a part of our work with Seed Saver Exchange, we are working on a re uh, rematriation project in which our growers can help find the seeds that are important to their families. And uh, some of you heard me talk about the uh, seed I found, the first one I found in my family, which was the Stone Mountain Watermelon. And there's a story to go with that. And so many of the seeds, we, we Suggest that you look for your own seed stories. All our growers have to, you know, it's like knowing your roots, knowing who you are, you know. Benita, we have a beautiful uh, question that kind of segues into what you were just saying. Um, we have a, a listener asking about the lucifone variety that you mentioned and wondering if um, you could speak more to the varieties collect connection with Angola. It sounds like this person's in-laws are from Galicia in Northwestern northwestern Spain, and they prepare something that looks a lot like collards. Could you tell us more about that, Lucifone? Um, I'm not a scholar on it. I, when I first uh, heard the story, I was skeptical of it. But uh, it is uh, documented somewhat. Chris knows more about the background. I am actually working with Angolan growers. We have Angolan growers, and we're now starting a program in Angola with scouts in which we're helping them to do their own research on what's culturally important in their community. So uh, Chris, if you could talk about what we know about the travels from Africa, is it myth or is there any science or, or true history behind it? Are you asking about the, the college's arrival? Yes. In, okay. Um, so, I would actually recommend going to listen to Michael Twitty's uh, initial presentation of Collard Week, because uh, he truly is a scholar on this, and uh, I think lays it out very well in that presentation. Uh, but in summary, and we've actually Ed Davis in his book, um, the Collard book that Melanie has listed, also has a section at the back which lists all the potential origin stories of collards in the Americas. And there's a, you know, did they come from Portugal? Did they come from Britain into the colonies and then down? Did they come directly from Africa? Um, and so multiple origin stories exist. Um, 
it seems like the most likely one and the one that Ed Davis, who has been researching this for decades, um, supports is that they came across as kind of as colwarts, like cabbages that when they were grown in the South expressed more of a leafy production and then were selected for those traits. Um, and so they came from kind of like European settlers in the North and then migrated down and then were adopted by enslaved Africans who uh, recognized the value of dark leafy greens and therefore were adopted into the Southern foodways because the, you know, the, the enslaved cooks and, and gardeners and, and agricultural labor and that agricultural, you know, intellect that came over uh, or was like intentionally stolen uh, is what allowed colleges to become such an integral part of African American and Southern foodways. Yeah, and just to speak to that Portuguese, remember the uh, Angolans uh, were the first uh, Africans to to become uh, to become Christianized to to become Christians, and so they were very much involved very early in uh, in the triangular trade, um, and Queen Nzinga. Uh, who uh, is the great, um, you know, Christian queen of uh, Angola. Many of those of you who know uh, the story of Angola know that um, she was very much involved in trade. And so it makes sense that, uh, that this vegetable uh, may have uh, traveled with the Africans, as did a whole bunch of other uh, uh, vegetables. I'm working currently with um, uh, someone from the University of Botswana, who's identified several varieties of kale that we know are African varieties. And of course, uh, other things like molokia and uh, other greens, uh, there's Ethiopian kale, other varieties that are called African kale, uh, also a Kenyan uh, spider plant. All of those are the things that we hope to bring to the uh, marketplace and make available um, not just the seed, but the stories that, uh, that inform us and enrich us and help us reclaim uh, a lost heritage. I just wanted to make a brief comment. We had a question in the chat about um, folks in Hawaii and Chris um, started to mention this about the ultra cross seed. And so for anyone that's wondering if, you know, collards will grow well for them, I would highly recommend ordering the ultra cross and seeing, you know, what varieties do well for you. Um, and then if you want to also, um, you know, have more specific varieties or individual varieties, just conducting your own trial uh, would be really helpful um, for your climate. And, you know, we know that collards do well in hot climates like the South. And we also know well that collards do well in the Pacific Northwest, which has a cooler climate. And our region is really great for growing seeds specifically. Um, and I just want to pop in the chat as well for anyone looking to grow collards. Um, Southern Exposure has some amazing growing guides and seed saving guides. And I think that that's a really great resource for anyone looking to steward their own collards and know more about what the biannual process is of saving seed on collards. So I just wanted to put a plug in for that. And for our Hawaii folks that are looking to grow this seed, I, I highly recommend doing your own trial and um, seeing what does well for you. And share your results with us. We wanna know. And if you have seeds that you'd like to share or sell, let's talk about that too. <laughs> So maybe time for one quick last question. Uh, let's see. I'm curious if you were panelists to give one recommendation for someone to start their own seed project or to, to initiate with collaborator, collaborators, what would you tell them? Any advice? I wonder if this might be a case of don't do what I did and do what I you know, do, do what I say, not what I do type of thing. Because I, I would imagine I should advise people to start small, but I can't think of a time when I've ever done that myself. So maybe I should shut up and let somebody else speak. That is good advice generally. 
Um, <clears throat> I don't know. There could be so many things. I wasn't prepared for this question, but um, I think what I've learned about community projects and collaborations in general, heirloom collared project and all others I've done is to, and we might have touched on this earlier, but just going into it really open-minded and not with your own viewpoints as being the way, um, you know, a lot of times working with different communities, results and ideas and activities just come out differently than you might've thought or expected. And I think what we've shown at the Heirloom Collard Project is it's actually really cool <laughs> that when we all come with different ideas and ways of sharing the work we do, it can be way better than doing it alone. Um, and I've definitely had to learn sometimes to like set aside my own expectations or biases or whatever and just kind of be as chill as I can, which is hard for me because I am very perfectionist and organized and want things a certain way, but uh, just kind of letting that go has been helpful for me. And I'd like to quote from my daughter's preschool song, um, why I might as well think big. Why should any thoughts be small? We might as well think big if we're going to think at all. <laughs> I love it. How about you, Kristen? Got loves and smiles from that in our chat, Benita. Big fan. Yeah, you got some sweethearts in this audience, too. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, shout out to you, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> I think we made a few people cry. Aww. One of my, That's one of my favorite sayings is about the, uh, of ideas, having big ideas. And usually you say, think out of the box. I say, no, we need some big ideas out of the barn should be our thinking, that big, out of the barn. Absolutely. Um, Kara here from Organic Seed Alliance. I'm so grateful for this session. You guys were amazing. And this project is such a great one to celebrate. Um, I do want to encourage everyone, in addition to all the great resources in the chat, um, that, that we'll be able to share. There are some really cool resources also on our trade show. And I wanna to try to get everyone who can to thank, give some love to our sponsors and the vendors who are here. Um, some of the books are gonna be available in the Acres bookstore over in the trade show. And there's a great giveaway for a $150 gift certificate. We've got a ton of fun gifts and gift baskets and gift certificates. And so we're hoping you'll stay on this call line um, for the trade show session that follows this and also use the links in the Organic Seed Commons to head over to the trade show. And we've got more fun um, coming. Um, and I just wanted to see if anyone else on the team had any announcements to share before we close out. All right. Well, That's so a huge thank you to everyone on this panel. Um, what a great morning this was. Really, really appreciate it. Um, Y'all are amazing. And you made me so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. But so yummy. <laughs> All right. Let's let's take our collared love and uh, go on with our day. And thanks everybody for coming in this morning.